Welcome to Robert Bellissimo at the Movies. This is a YouTube video podcast where we explore all things cinema. I want to welcome back to my show, Raquel Stetcher, who is a film historian and critic. She's a writer for Turner Classic Movies, and she's also contributed articles to the Library of Congress, The Dark Pages, Film Detective, and Cinna Suffragette. In 2007, she started the classic film blog, Out of the Past, and in 2018, branched out with Kel Movies, a website devoted to new releases. She is a certified critic for Rotten Tomatoes and Cherry Picks and a member of the Online Association of Film Female Film Critics. Raquel, welcome back. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Robert. I'm, I'm really excited to, to come back to your channel. Yes, me too. It's always great to have you for anyone who's uh, follows my show uh, for Raquel will certainly be a familiar face. So let me just read a little plot out here for contempt for people who perhaps haven't seen it. This is the one off of Letterbox. A Philistine in the art film business, Jeremy Prokosh, is a producer unhappy with the work of his director. Prokosh has hired Fritz Lang, who's playing himself, to direct an adaptation of The Odyssey. But when it seems that the legendary filmmaker is making a picture destined to bomb at the box office, he brings in a screenwriter to energize the script. The professional intersects with the personal when a rift develops between the writer and his wife. Okay, so I'm curious, did, is when, when, when we agreed to talk about this today, had you seen it before or was this a first viewing for you? Yeah, I had seen it around 2012. I was deep in my Fritz Lang deep dive and I was watching like as much mm. Fritz Lang as possible. And I was getting towards the end of his career and I thought it was interesting. Wow, he was an actor in pretty much this one film. Like he had appeared um, as an actor in like one of his early silence that's lost. Um, but this is really his only acting performance. And I thought, oh, well, I got to watch this. And I was also learning more about the French New Wave. I was watching, you know, Jean Luc Godard and Francois Truffaut, and um, and I thought, wow, it kind of matches these two interests of mine. And I was like, what is this film? This film is is kind of nuts, but it's it's also really interesting. It's beautiful. There's <clears throat> um, it's very much an auteur film, like it's Godard stamp all over it. But I think <laughs> it's really interesting how Fritz Lang is also like really prominent. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. It's, you know, it's interesting because he, Godard's movies, uh, you know, like the, the the movies he made in the 60s are, are, are the ones from Breathless to, you know, the, to about, you know, 1970 are, are the ones that people mostly talk about, yeah, with, with the exception of some later, because then he got into like, you know, I guess like, you describe it as like, you know, filmed essays and were like really <laughs> museum really, exhibitions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, a number of them I've turned off, like I've started some and then I would I just could not get into them. Uh, and then some I've I have really liked. And, and as I've kind of keep returning to him, uh, um, not that I've seen everything, but some of his more narrative um you know uh focus films from you know the even in the 80s onwards uh, or in the 70s uh so, some of them i've 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 quite liked so i'm still exploring him um but this is a film that was was one of the few that i uh with the exception i guess of breathless one of the few that i i took to um mm -hmm. immediately and i saw it when i was you know quite young it like i was like 19 so i think I, 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 there's no way I could have really understood a lot of the complexities of what was going on, other than the fact that okay, we have this art versus commerce uh, story, and then this 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 marriage that's breaking apart. Um, but it's quite. I always just took to it. It, it just had such a a feel for for me, and every time I watch it. I, I really do like it more and more. And like I said yesterday, we were writing each other. It's a, it's a hard film to discuss because there's there's so much to unpack here. And I was just curious, you know, for you, this would probably be easier to, you know, to sum up. But what what just what are some of the things that stood out to you that you fit you felt this film was exploring? I really like the fact that it's 
Meta, you know, it's a filmmaker making a movie about filmmaking and it kind of captures the the later stage of like that Italian, you know, boom of culture that happened post World War II. You have like those opening shots of like Cinecita, the famous Italian movie studio, and everything's kind of abandoned. It's almost like the ruins of that era where you have like Sophia Loren and, you know, Gina Lola Brigida and all of these like um, big you know Italian movie stars and like there's Italian boom and this is kind of at the tail end of it and I thought that was Mm. that was really interesting and also uh you know you have this story about love turning into contempt with you know the two main actors um um, Brigitte Bardot and Michelle Piccoli just like having this marriage fall apart so that's really interesting too And then you have, um, like you said, the art versus commerce. You have that battle between Hollywood, conventional filmmaking, and how that often gets in the way of, um, of like artistic expression and being true to your artistic vision. And, you know, how, how like the dollar signs often blind um the like the art form essentially like getting to the real art form and one thing too like an added layer which I didn't realize on previous viewings that I really came to appreciate this is it's about adaptation because Mm. in the film they're um, making it an adaptation of Homer's The Odyssey and that's really like one of the first stories ever to be adapted because that one Um, Homer's The Odyssey was, you know, in the oral tradition, it was a spoken story, and then it was um, adapted into a book form where it captures all of that, but it it was intended to be spoken. So now you have it in a book form, and then now you have it in a movie form. (laughs) They're making a, a, a film, a film adaptation of this story, and how it's like almost several, um, uh, several steps like removed from the original art and I think that's kind of Godard saying like how how art is expressed based on the medium you know and how that changes and that how that changes based on the players involved which I think is explored a lot in this movie so it's got like it's got like different storylines like the main one is the the love story falling apart but it's really about so many other things too yeah no i completely agree it's 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 really complex in in so many ways and it's interesting to me that godard uh at least in this film because he's 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 very in- intellectual in even in his filmmaking and you know he was a critic and 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 things you know everything like that and and you know he's very politically um minded and he manages to make something both intellectual but then at the same time uh have a real complicated relationship in this marriage so it's sort of it doesn't just rely on motifs and uh metaphors to to and you know things like that it also has that you know that 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 middle part in the flat where it's just the two of them and the 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 contradictions and the the complexity um of that scene is very uh you know something that you'd see from you know Antonioni to me or 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 even not on a vi- you know Cassavetti's Cassavetti's visuals were much different and his perfor- the way his performance uh performances the actors gave also but it reminded me of that in the sense that these people like just hashing things out mm-hmm. um so it's like where so it's like where do you begin but i think i think the the relationship to me is is probably the most the most interesting uh mm-hmm. part of the film so what what to you was was the problems here between camille and and paul i mean what do you think you know because they seem very very much in love at the beginning and and you know it it just totally obliterates so what what to you got in you know what was the led to the downfall well i think you know goddard um like jean-luc goddard was very much about not selling out and this is like his one like real commercial film so he's got this like message about 
selling out essentially that kind of goes through Mm -hmm. through the movie and I think it plays into the marriage in particular because the husband character is a uh, screenwriter and he is basically kind of becoming submissive to this very brash American producer um, played by Jack Palance and um Anytime Jack Palance tells him something, he kind of acquiesces it, acquiesces to it. So they're both representing like two different forms of masculinity. One is a very like forward and um, very like in control and will resort to violence almost like to to get his way. And then you have this other masculine character who is more submissive and that is starting to upset her. Like the fact that Mm -hmm. he is this creative person, he's this screenwriter and he's acquiescing to this other power instead of standing up for his art and she's losing respect for him. And you see her, you know, towards the end, basically try to showcase that she is having an affair with this producer now to upset him and that to me is the way her of her showing that you know this is a real man you are not a real man you know that kind of like that's her obviously that's her perspective um and to me that's kind of um John Godard's like like sort of subtle message that um you should be true to your artistic self and you should really fight for your vision Um, And don't let these outside voices, you know, change your mind because he had all these struggles with this movie. Like he wanted Frank Sinatra and Kim Novak and didn't get them. He got somebody else. Brigitte Bardot wasn't his idea. She was put in the film because she was like super famous. So he's struggling with all these outside um, voices, but he's really trying to be true to himself. But this character is like the polar opposite in that's where she she develops her contempt for him. Essentially, she goes from love to contempt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that I I was really fascinated by that because she even says that she was you know she was happier when they were poor when he was just writing like yeah. you know as she says like these crime novels and she talks about how they were had these wild adventures almost I took it almost as if she saw them as one was whereas now they're very separate you know now things are about money and and things are about much more about his career and getting ahead and they're they're Mm -hmm. trying to pay off this flat and so this has has led to to a separation between um between the two of them which i find really you know i find that really um really compelling but and then on the other hand there's like this dynamic at play because i kept thinking why does she get this black wig you know uh very and it looks like his his ex uh anna karina uh and and i think i think some of you know you can't help but think that some of this is based on godard i mean piccoli with that hat <laughs> that's you know mm-hmm. which is the same hat that godard wore uh, i mean he when he references he talks about dean martin and some came running but, mm-hmm. you know, which I'm sure there's truth to that. But at the same time that there, I think, you know, it's undoubtedly like based on on things that happened between him, Godard and and, and Anna Karina. But that that black wig, um, I kept thinking, why does she you know, it's not not only does she just wear it in the flat, like she also wears it out later. Yeah. Um, even though everyone knows her now, you know, and, and saw her with her, you know, long blonde hair. And I kept thinking what is that about and you know it it's there is this dynamic where he's like the smart guy and she's like the dumb blonde and i think you know she he married like this trophy wife uh that everyone is is like in awe of like oh you're you know even jack palance i heard your wife is so is so beautiful and things like that and you know he even insults her a couple of you know he calls her like it's just a stupid typist and so I think the the that I think that really bothered her. It like I think it made her feel insecure. Um I can you know, see that. and I think the yeah, I think the black wig may have been like, you know, may, maybe she would be taken more seriously if she got mm-hmm. rid of the um of the of the blonde hair. And I think that's also part of the reason why she would never tell him why she stopped loving him because he's arrogant and thinking that he has her all figured out. 
he's like, oh, well, you know, you, you know, he's very insensitive to me anyways, when he's like, oh, well, you're mad at me just because I let you get in the car with, um, with the producer uh, and, or you know, you're mad at me just because I made a pass at that other woman. Uh, you know, you see earlier, he's very flirtatious with the second Francesca, the secretary, mm -hmm. and he thinks he has all these things figured out. And I think for her, it was like, oh, you think you're so smart. And, and, and we never really get to the bottom of, of why, you know, it's really open to interpretation. Why, um, this love has has just for her turned to complete contempt and I, so i was really i was really fascinated by that and even though he shot that you know that first scene <laughs> where you know where she's well you don't see you know it's not full frontal nudity but it's you know you see her completely naked you know from <laughs> from the back down to the legs right you know her bum is right out there which of course he was forced to do you know the producer yeah. was like you know, she turned the movie in and he was like, you know, you got Bridget Bardot where you, you don't even have any sexy scenes, nothing where she's naked or anything. So that was the one compromise he made. And but he, you know, he doesn't just do it and, you know, just slash it in there. It's sort of like he plays at like the fact that he shows that they were really in love. But it's you could even potentially look at it as her insecurities because she kept asking to him oh do you like my breasts do you like my knees what do you like better my nipples my shoulder, my yeah. yeah and you know so one can interpret that as perhaps an insecurity but then on the other hand maybe that's tongue-in-cheek from godard's perspective thinking like it's almost like she's asking the audience oh you want to see me naked what do you think mm -hmm. of my bum what do you think of this <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if if any of that resonated with you, but I I couldn't help but wonder if that's what some of the things Godard may have been exploring there. I mean, I I think I think you're right, especially um, with the fact that she's got like intellectual interests and artistic interests because you see her she's yeah. in the bathtub reading the book on Fritz Lang the Lang and later book, in yeah. the movie when um you know Godard has to put in another um nude scene like he said that he had to put in a Brigitte Bardot nude scene at the beginning, in the middle, and then at the end. And at the end, she has a, <laughs> a book on her bum, like while she's like um, right, right, you know, right. sunbathing. So, yeah. and also she's taking an interest in um, how her husband is approaching his artistic career. So she's got, she she's, she's not the dumb blonde. She's like, she actually has some interest but like the validation yeah. she gets from these men is from her physical appearance like right okay right. i need some validation which we all kind of need in relationships and she can really only get it through um through like the the physical aspects but um one thing i thought was interesting i had listened to the commentary the criterion commentary that they made for for this movie and the the his the film historian who's talking um he was saying that um, since Godard had to put in these nude scenes, he approached it in a way where the camera is looking at her like she's a statue. Not that she's like a sexual being, like in a seductive pose. She's in like one real seductive pose where she's kind of wrapped in like a red blanket and she's kind of like, okay, let's let's make love right now, you know? Um oh, and yeah, that's the like couch, in the flat yeah. scene in the in the in the center of the film, but um mostly the way the camera pans over her body makes her look like a statue. Mm -hmm. um, and then you see the statues throughout the film, which are like the ancient statues, oh, yes, of yes. ancient figures. And they're painted. They're painted like with a little bit of blue, like red, yellow, and blue are super important in yes, this movie. Yes, they're like the visual yes. language um, of the film. And you see them painted. And I just kind of think that that kind of speaks to the you know Godard's maybe vision in saying like okay we have the sex kitten but I'm not going to portray her that way I'm going to portray her as somebody who has like maybe a little more going on you know she's not just available in fact she's not even really that interested in the sex part she's more interested in you know the power dynamics between her the producer and her and her husband and um in the statues, like these kind of ancient statues painted almost like with this, almost like with makeup, like it's not real makeup, mm. it's not like lipstick or anything, but they're painted in a way that they're highlighted. And I just thought that that observation was really interesting because it, the way the camera treats her naked body is 
is more unusual. It's not sexual. It's yeah. more like here's a piece of art. Right. Right. Yeah. It 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 doesn't it, it it's it's he's taking he's like putting a spin on the male gaze, you know. It's it's yeah. felt it felt yeah, it felt more you know, again, not just she's she is objectified by people in the film, particularly mm-hmm. Palance. And so he's he's really making her much more of a fleshed out human being um, with real feelings. And, you know, talking Which is about great. That, in this era, you have like in the 60s, you have yeah. women with really thankless roles just being like a sex object on screen. And this right. is she's a sex object but she's got more nuance and she's a more important character in the story and she has more to do she has opinions i mean it's more fleshed out yeah certainly and you know the fact it's interesting because you you begin to see that she is turning her feelings uh or or her love for him is going away at at the moment when palan says get in the car with me Mm -hmm. And, and he says yeah yeah go ahead i'll take a cab now, on the one hand, perhaps I could see why he would have thought, well, I don't want to, the producer who just gave me all this money to think I'm jealous. So, but at the same time, I could totally see why she'd be, you, she would feel sort of betrayed to think like, are you like offering me up to this guy? Like yeah. he's clearly pleasly. Like, as she fight walked for me? by Come him. <laughs> yeah. As she walked by him, he touches her arm. He's already, you know, so it, I could see what, like, you know, you get into a car with this producer, you know, you get to the, to the apartment, he, you know, it took like a half an hour for him to get there. He says it was like this accident and all this kind of stuff. So I could see why she would be like, this guy could have, you know, he could have attacked her. He could have, mm-hmm. you know, and he, and he, he even jokes about it. Oh, did he make a pass of you kind of thing? Um, and then again, later, right. It's even on the shoot again, he's like, yeah, come with me. And he says, even, and at this point he knows that she had a problem with it. And I felt, I thought Bridget Bardot played it so well, you know, she seems really hurt. She says, Paul, and he's like, yeah, yeah, go ahead. So that, you know, really, again, that's what those feelings begin to turn among, you know, all, you know, so many other things that we were that we just we were discussing but then at those contradictions at the same time because then she'll after the fight you know when he's at the typewriter she's like no no I, I love you I really love you or even after he hits her uh and then they both hug and they apologize to one another mm-hmm. you know and and even in the performance I thought they were both so good because it has more of that Ed, like Antoniesque Antonia if that's a word if that's a phrase <laughs> you know of um, very more muted performances very subtle and even though he's they're talking about they're confronting each other, which, you know, perhaps would sound on paper like a real fight. And it is a fight, but it's done in a very casual sense, almost a, a maturity in the fact that they're able to hash out these feelings in a casual way. Like there's an openness there, which I think is rooted in their love. Uh, I think they're able to do that because they love it. like it doesn't feel like a total hate fest which, um, you know, would, would have been easy to do. I think I think the fact that they are communicating in such a way, even later after he kissed, she, he sees her kiss Palance. He's like, mm-hmm. I saw you kiss him. She's like, yeah, I did. <laughs> you know, it's very, it, there's a, there's, it's interesting, but obviously that love, I can believe the love and then I can totally believe the contempt. I don't know if that was anything that resonated with you. I think I think what you're saying is is interesting because really their love it, for each other is complex. Like there's it's not just straight mm. a straight love story. It's love with, you know, some some resentment, some hate. There's one point where he like goes to grab a gun and it's kind of a false yes. flag. You think, "Oh, he'll shoot her later," you know? Like he it's it's almost like if That's I can I have you, no one can have you. But he doesn't do anything with the gun. It's like a total right, right, right. like red herring. And yeah. also, I mean, that really speaks to um, Godard's films. Like everything's open to interpretation. This very much so. love story is like in how the love story is ending. It's just so complex. There's so many different like layers to it. There's things that can be interpreted totally different ways. There's things that are intentionally vague. And it just makes mm, yes, for something yes. interesting because it's not necessarily like a straight love story that, you know, their relationship ends because it's an affair. It's so much more complex. Yes, than it's that. not simplistic. Going on. Yeah, 
no, I, I, I completely agree. And I think he, I think he perhaps is getting at something that, you know, these sparks that go away and these love, this love that goes away cannot always just be explained, you know, like mm-hmm. it's, it, there's a mystery to why, I mean, yeah, not, not, we, we can identify why people break up, but you know, it's not always that simple. And I think he was getting at the mystery of why sparks run out. And I can even think of my own life of, of, you know, beginning to see someone who I, you know, felt so strongly about. And then maybe a month later uh, with reasons that I, you know, maybe couldn't even put together in my own mind, why the spark was gone uh, mm-hmm. or vice versa, maybe not as much of a spark, but then it grew. Right. And, and so you know, we can we can we can have insight into it, but I don't think it could be ever like love is just too complicated. Yeah. Feelings are just not something that one can discuss so neatly. Um, it's true. Yeah, yeah. So that that really fascinated me, and I have to um, credit uh, Jonathan Rosenbaum's uh, review of this because he was on my show back in the summer, and he wrote a really a, a review that I thought was really, really good. And I mean, so, some of the things that I'll break up are, are are maybe just ideas he put in my head that I sort of interpreted uh, in my own way. So I'm not quoting directly from him, but there was a lot of, of things he said that was interesting. In turn, like, for example, he talks about the fact that it's it's almost like the, the, the Greek gods uh, uh, watching, you know, when they cut to those statues, because yeah. here they are making the Odyssey, you know, and they are in like this beautiful city. They've got the money to do it. Uh, they have Fritz Lang, who's this great artist. And of course, the film is just being destroyed uh, because of because of money. And I couldn't help but wonder if it, like cutting to the here we are in Rome or this is a city of art, um, this beautiful landscapes. And I couldn't help but wonder if sometimes those greedy gods, it's like the disappointment, you know, of mm-hmm. look at what you guys are doing. And <laughs> look because at they're what painted you guys are doing. with like fresh modern paint, like like over the eyes or I believe like on the mouth. Um, it's almost yeah. like, okay, here you're taking this beautiful ancient artwork and you're slapping some paint on it. You're changing it for a modern eye. And are you ruining it? Are you damaging it by not being true yes. to it? Yes, that's a good point. I didn't think of that. Uh, in, in terms of some of those in some of those colors and which which also goes to the style because as you said earlier it, you know he was forced to do it in cinescope which at that yeah. you know these lush wide screen color yeah. <laughs> technicolor and again godard doesn't just do it he does something with it so mm. he 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 sort of clashes the style with a more art european art house film like particularly the middle part which is again mm-hmm. like like i said very mike michelangelo and tony s and tony oni like uh where you know for example you know he's got a wall separating them on either side which shows that real distance which and he oh, had yeah. shot like that you um, have bardot on the bed and you get the sliver of the door and then yes yes Nicole is like yes. in the front in the foreground and it's all white but then you get the pop of the red from the bedroom oh that is a beautiful shot Yes. And those shots say so much, you know, and, and they're, you know, another, I, I, but I think he used the widescreen so well because there isn't a lot of close-ups. There is like, occasionally close-ups because there people are always in the same shot and, you know, or, or they're in the same shot, but totally separate, like for like towards the end when she, she jumps in the ocean and she's swimming and then you see him against the rock. I mean, yeah. it almost looks like two separate shots. They, they may as well be in two separate worlds. Him against it on the land and her in the water. And even though they're in, the same, they're in the same shot, they're totally separate. So it's sort of like, it's interesting how he clashes those those two styles together. And so, again, it's almost a, 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 a comment on not so much, because, you know, he loved a lot of classic Hollywood filmmakers mm-hmm. like you know I, I don't want to say that he's criticizing quote-unquote Hollywood but I think he's quote he's criticizing the more commercially minded money motivated tech you know technicolor Absolutely. and you know you know he sort of does things badly on purpose like for example and again I got this from Rosenbaum um you know for example he 
has these flashbacks and I'm like, what, what is motivating these flashbacks? They seem like totally jump cuts seem totally random or at the end when they go toward, not towards the end, it's around the middle when they go to the stage show to check out that one actor to see if she could be in the movie. And this stage show is a disaster. It's, it's like, awful. I was, <laughs> it's so bad. And every now and then the soundtrack just goes out, you know, yes. like, and, Whereas usually the background noise would then would would go down so that we can hear the audio. He just takes the 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 soundtrack right out, so then we hear. I heard the that that was a you know. commentary on how what you see in film is not real because, like, if you were to have characters like in a cafe and they're talking, and you have like the hustle and bustle of like everything, the conversations that are happening behind them, and suddenly the 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 sound has to go down. Because you're you're now trying to listen into the conversation yeah, between the yeah. characters in the cafe, mm. so I had heard that it was kind of a commentary on that how it's not real. Like you wouldn't have all this yes. sound, and then it would just cut out. You know, like exactly. but you need it exactly. for the film form because then how would you hear the conversation over? It? And I thought that was really interesting. And um, also one thing that um, the cinematographer Raul Coutard he did in that scene in particular, and he does it in some other scenes too. Is it the the camera goes from left to right and right to left like a pendulum swing? Oh yes, yes, yes. And yes, it just yes. it goes like quite far over the characters. Like you might have two at a table in that scene. It's like uh, I think Bardot and Lang are on one side, and then maybe Palance and Piccoli are on the other, and the interpreter somewhere somewhere in there. And the camera's kind of going back and forth over the aisle to the seats and i just thought that yeah, like yes. visually is really interesting um yes i'm sure it has more meaning than i'm thinking about but like maybe it's to kind of display the power dynamic and how things shift in conversation and um but it, i thought visually it was really cool well he's i think he's he's creating a sort of mess you know and i think that mm -hmm. speaks to the <laughs> to the emotional relationships with the not with with not only the marriage, but amongst the producer and Lang and then the mm -hmm. filmmaker and the producer. I mean, this whole thing is a mess. And I think so. He <laughs> sort of is taking that beauty and and muddling with it, um, which yeah. is a pretty bold move. And, you know, at the time, the film, I mean, I love the criticism was was poor. I mean, it was not well received. And and I think, you know, he was sort of ahead of his time and a lot. Uh, I mean, I don't know if people are just 30 years later or something caught up with it. If I don't, I don't necessarily think people are more sophisticated and when they were looking at it in, in the nineties and the sixties, um, I know Ro Rosenbaum had said that, but I think it just, you know, anything that's new, which is so like, no one has done anything like this always seems like, like chaotic and just a total mess and disaster. Uh, but I, I, I can see, you know, I think these things were intentional because even the the movie that Lang shoots, which they're showing these statues, that looks like garbage. Like, what is he doing? <laughs> you know, well, it looks like absolute crap. Yeah. You know? I mean, Godard is definitely self-sabotaging here because <laughs> he is, like, basically made to make this more commercial film. And he is... He's always been, he's al always in his life been rebellious against yeah, yeah. like conventional filmmaking. He was just not Definitely. about that. And you can see that throughout his entire career. And this was probably maybe his most conventional approach because it it was like an American producer and it was about um, filmmaking, but it was supposed to have like these big stars and kind of be appealing to an American audience because the producer, um, Joseph Levine, was at the time very big about bringing those European films over to America because he he saw potential in these movies that the Europeans were making that had a lot more sex and had a lot exactly, more things yeah. going on. <laughs> Richard Bardot in the nude, that would appeal to yeah. an American audience. But like Godard is sabotaging that. Like the potential yeah. this has as a commercial success, he's sabotaging it throughout the whole film by like, okay, you want me to have Bridget Bardot in the nude? I'm going to do it in a different way that is yeah. not going to, is not going to be what you want, but it's going to check a box. And I just think that's yeah. really interesting. 
Yeah, certainly. And even in that first scene, you know, it's like, why does the filter go from blue to red? Then there's no filter. I mean, it's, it's, he's totally, you know, he's, I mean, you know, and, and you could say often he had that self-conscious filmmaking where he's making the audience yeah. aware of even, even, I mean, you're always aware you're watching a movie, but now you're more aware of the technique. Yes, and uh, definitely in this one for sure. This, this one for sure, and and he and he always does it for a reason, and I and for all the things that we've described, and it makes it for a more frustrating viewing viewing experience. It almost puts you in the frustration amongst the characters because mm -hmm. when those flashbacks happen or when these colors happen, I'm thinking, and I'm sure a lot of people are thinking, why? Uh, uh, and of course, it's uh, it's it's open to interpretation. I mean, a lot of things I read, like you're describing things you read that pe that people said different things about. Um, so again, it's it's these clash of styles, the kind of very mm -hmm. Hollywood commercial Technicolor with the art house, with the more sort of uh, uh, jump cuts, but that, like sometimes poorly done. You know, like you even mentioned with the gun, which I thought you had a really interesting interpretation with that. But you could even you could even interpret that as just being totally random. Like he gets his gum, and then later on, the uh, the assistant. Uh, or no, was it Bridget Bardot who who mentions that she found the gun and took the bullets out and <laughs> and stuff like that? So these things just are 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 you know intentionally uh, messy, and it's again it's commenting on this this battle within the film between money and and art, and we see that so much on the visuals with these lush shots and you know it's so interesting because often he'll show like Bridget Bardot or Piccoli alone with mm. these beautiful backdrops oh, but they I look know. yeah exactly so we have this beauty but they look so small and alone in those in those wide shots and and lonely and it I just I just think it's it's brilliant I mean it's absolutely you know for every single shot we could discuss and interpret so much you know it's so true <laughs> and even like within the story you have the battle of like conventional filmmaking from a hollywood producer and then a director who um is more taking a philosophical approach like yeah. the fritz lang character is thinking about i think it's like um how this could be like a freudian take on the odyssey whereas the jack Palance character the 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 character name i always <laughs> Always, it's always kind of a strange, like Prokosh. Like I, I never yeah, know how to say name. it. But he's very name. much um, modeled after Joseph Levine, the actual producer who is uncredited, like Carlo Ponti and uh, I think it was George Bogart. I forget the name of the other producer. Joseph Levine isn't named, um, isn't credited because he thought he hated the movie. And he was like, this is the worst movie ever made. I hate it, even though he financed it. <laughs> um, right. But I think it's interesting that the Jack Palance Pal character, who's modeled after um, Joseph Levine, is very much like, okay, let's do something different with it. Let's make Penelope, who's Odysseus's wife, she Odysseus leaves her because Penelope had an affair. Like, let's yes, spice yes, it yes. up. And that's mm. totally what, like, Joseph Levine would have done, because he was bringing uh, over all these European films that were kind of oh, much spicier. He was doing a lot of the sword and sandal films you know like the like the and and he wanted films that would like titillate american audiences yes, yes and um so i can see how within the story that's goddard's kind of like interpretation of it you know fritz lang here's the seasoned director knows what he's doing he wants to make you know his own vision and then Jack Palance's character wants it to make money, wants it to be a commercial hit yeah. and, and a, yeah. please, a, a please audiences so they'll spend money, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like like we were saying, like he he does that not only in the dynamics, but also in, in the visuals uh, with these with these clash of styles. But I I I love uh, the dynamic between Lang and <laughs> and Palance between this. I mean, some of the some of the lines too between them are really humorous. Like uh, at one point in in the cut in the screening room, Fritz Lang is talking about he's talking about culture, and then Jack Palance goes, "When I hear culture, I take out my checkbook." <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, and then and then Palance says, "Oh yeah, the, the, sorry, Fritz Lang says, oh yeah, the Nazis had a different 
different word for cult uh, for for uh, checkbook. It was revolver, you know. And so he's basically comparing him to a Nazi. It's just the way they addressed each other. Like as soon as Palance comes into the screening room, you see like Lang just kind of like you know looks depressed and disgusted. Like here's the producer um, in here. To, and he's to... like violent in that scene, like Jack Palance's oh character. Like God, he's kicking, love it. he's kicking the film canisters, <laughs> and then he's having the translator like pick them up, and then he kicks them again. He like shoves her over so he can like sign something, and right, right, um, right, right, right. He, like the 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 potential for like violence or danger is definitely displayed there. And what I think is yeah. interesting, and um, you and I were talking about this before, is like how. Fritz Lang in real life was kind of like the Jack Palance character. He was very yes. rash and he was that. very like very much about what he wanted to do. There are people who refuse to work with him again. Like um, wow. uh, Peter Laurie worked with him on M, refused to work with him. Spencer Tracy worked with him on Fury, refused to work with him. Henry Fonda also refused to work with him again. Like uh, there's like some big actors the only wow. ones who actually um, saw something in Fritz Lang were willing to suffer for multiple films were like Sylvia Sidney and Joan Bennett. It's but interesting he had that it would be terrible women. Terrible reputation, even from right. his, when he was at Ufa in Germany through his Hollywood career. I mean, he he pissed a lot of people off. So what I think yeah. is interesting is that Jean Luc Godard's version of Fritz Lang is kind of romanticized in a way. Fritz Lang is like more chill He's laid back. yeah <laughs> yes it's interesting i never knew that about him and, and apparently they they go dark got along the best with lang oh yeah i could see that <laughs> yeah yeah and he didn't get a he didn't get along very well with palance uh and and they you know, were he polar didn't... opposites too like fritz lang very conventional filmmaker came up from the <laughs> silent film era like making these you know, science fiction epics like Metropolis and Woman in the Moon. And then his Hollywood career was very interesting. He made like film noirs and westerns and yeah. he made like one musical, a crime crime dramas. Like he did everything in the conventional space of Hollywood. Um, even, uh, but he gave it his own spin that elevated the form. Whereas Godard was very much like completely unconventional would not work in that and i think and i had i had read somewhere that they um because i thought like how did godard get fritz lang for this movie i thought that was interesting because fritz lang had already pretty much retired he was almost blind at the point that he made contempt like he had his last film was um the 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 last dr mabusa film like thousand eyes of dr mabusa and that was like three years before this film came out and he didn't direct anything after that um but like how did how did he get Godard how did Godard get Lang to make this and apparently they really liked each other Lang kind of liked that Godard was like this young kind of unconventional filmmaker trying all these new things and Godard had this extreme respect for Lang having this long career trying all these different things kind of being film history essentially from like the very beginning um so I think that that dynamic is really interesting and in how mm -hmm. you get an interpretation of Lang. It's Fritz Lang and he's got the history, but it's a fictional version of Fritz Lang in the movie right. through Godard's right. lens. And it's just, right. that really fascinates me. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, that's interesting. And I never, I never knew that. And, you know, like I, as you know, I love your book collection and there's that Lang book behind you as well as the yeah, on the, the wrong way <laughs> yeah there we go are how how are how do you like those two books yeah um i'll say i actually have also one on this is uh fritz lane the nature of the beast by patrick mcgilligan and see like i have a lot of <laughs> notes <laughs> that i took and like um um, this is fascinating. This is pretty much the standard Fritz Lang biography. The one that Brigitte Bardot reads in the movie is a book that obviously came out around that time. That one, I don't even know if it's in print, but that one I yes. believe is like the first book about Fritz Lang's like career. Um, but this one, this one is really good. It was like re-released several years ago. And then this book, um, Showman on the Screen about Joseph Levine. 
um, by A.T. McKenna. This is excellent. And I got so much information and researching um, contempt for this for for this recording. And I like learned so much from just this book. Um, oh, wow. And he was a very interesting. I mean, both Lang and Levine were very interesting characters. And then they're pretty much played in the movie like laying as himself yes. and then palance as levine and yeah. i almost feel bad for palance because he's he's stuck playing this playing essentially godard's contempt for hollywood <laughs> that's like what his his character is <laughs> yeah yeah no i love i love palance in this i mean <laughs> because you know it, it's interesting when he's throwing those film can uh film cans around like a frisbee it's interesting because he actually never screams and it's almost more powerful when he's like you lied to me fritz or he says something mm -hmm. like that as he's throwing everything and such a he brought a humor to it as well like when he's laughing when 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 they see the mermaid the naked mermaid on the screen and he gets so excited just the, his no one has a face like this guy i mean oh, oh. my god and he had, I, a, I he had a face, he... he had a presence, he was so oh, tall God, and yeah. like like broad like this broad shoulder. He had like this presence this that was really so interesting. Good. Yeah. He was so good. But I love what he says to him. He's like, Yeah, he's like, this is good for me and you, uh, Fritz, but I don't know if the audience <laughs> I don't know if the audience <laughs> would get it. <laughs> and I'm like, what would they not get? It's a <laughs> you know, it's a naked uh, image, but yeah, like, and, 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 you know, this is the only film I've seen with uh, Brigitte Bardot. I have not seen, I have to see more of her film because I know she's in some really, really good ones, but she, I think she was perfect for it because she, her face, she has such an aura of mystery to me, mm. you know, like she just has this intensity and darkness. And, and I mean, yeah, she's very beautiful, but there's a real mystery there that you cannot, which is, which works so well for this character because just like she won't tell her husband what the, what the real problems are of why she no longer lo loves her. We can't quite figure her out either. You know, and I just think she's great. I don't know how you felt feel about her in general as an actor. Yeah, I don't know as much about her, but I thought it was interesting that sh her character in the film is essentially her. She's this famous model. She, I think the the term sex kitten was invented for her. Um, yeah. And she was at the height of her fame. She's super famous. And... I, th I think it's interesting that she really wanted to wor work with Godard. She asked to work with him and then the producer saw an opportunity. Hey, let's put, let's put Brigitte Bardot in this and make sure she's naked in the, in the film. But then you see, okay, there's a little more to her. She's not just this yeah. model who's exceptionally beautiful and a, a major worldwide celebrity. She's also an actress and she, um, was really interested in working with this very unconventional filmmaker and doing something different. So I think kind of their character, like the the character and the real Bardot kind of, kind of, um, yeah. yeah, kind of like parallel each other a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so as well. And like I said, her and Piccoli, he, he, he had been in a number of films, but I think this was his first big starring role. And just this is like a lot of his... Luis Buñuel films, so yes, I recognize yes. him. <laughs> yeah, I've seen him in a lot of, of movies after this, and he's always really good. He's he's mm -hmm. very, very nuanced, extremely subtle. Um, yeah, I thought their dynamic was uh perfect. And just the other thing I wanted to mention, which you know, early, you know, some 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 critics have criticized Godard for doing this, you know, because he'll have characters you know, quoting from different philosophers or poets and here they're quoting from Dante or and stuff. Brecht and comes <laughs> <Brecht>. up, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it may, some critics feel that he's making the audience feel stupid, uh, but other people have interpreted it as, no, no, he's he sort of makes you feel like you'll know these quotes just as well as he does. So mm -hmm. I don't know, I guess people take to it in, in different ways. But one thing that I noticed Piccoli, he quotes, I believe it's Dante in the screening room, and he says, um, night then saw all the stars. We were filled with gladness, which soon turned to tears until the sea closed in upon us. And it's funny because at the end, the last shot is the sea, told just the oh, sea yeah. with nothing. And it's just like, it's the sea has closed in on the relationship. And also, 
The flip side is that tracking shot. We see Eleusius, um, I, be, I think that's how you pronounce it. Alus, is it Alusis? Alusis? The, the oh, main character. Ulysses? In, Ulysses, sorry. In uh, the Odyssey. And he looks like triumphant, which is so funny because no one is triumphant <laughs> in this. You know, that's a and good so, observation, yeah. Yeah, yeah, which is interesting. And some people have felt that that there is a parallel between the Odyssey and the marriage that's breaking up here. Uh, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. I wasn't too sure. I don't know the Odyssey well, so I don't know if they were getting at that there's a connection between the marriage in the Odyssey and the marriage here. I don't know if you had any any opinions on I that. I love the Odyssey. And um, that story is, is, I mean, it is a story about um, a marriage. And you have yeah. Odysseus who, you know, leaves for war and tries to come back to his wife Penelope. But um, he has to go, He basically he and his men go through all these obstacles just to get home. It's almost like the Wizard of Oz, you know, like <laughs> Dorothy just wants to get home. He just wants to get home. Right, and right. she has all these suitors because everyone thinks he might be dead. And she has all of these suitors who want her um, and she's weaving something. And, and she says, once I finish weaving this, um, I will pick a suitor to marry. But then she, every night she like undoes what she's weaving so that it buys her more time. So it's really much about like these two people who are utterly devoted to each other. He's determined to get back to her and Penelope is determined to wait for him. And that's, I mean, that's not quite like what's in the story, but <laughs> no, not at um, all. <laughs> but maybe it like it maybe it is reflective of the fact that, you know, they are breaking apart. They don't have yeah. the same connection. The and same also, strength, if you think yeah. about it, Jack Palance's character is like, let's make Penelope the one who like cheats on him, and that's why he leaves. So in a way, he's kind of just destroying the art form the like mm. of homer's original story and yeah. maybe that's why we have the bardo character um you know falling out of love with her husband because she saw the, him as this artist and he's sort of corrupting the form too by by just allowing this palance character to tell him what to do i mean there's so much to unpack here i think the only other thing i was going to mention was the middle section, which I believe is like around a half an hour of them in the flat mm -hmm. and never gets boring to me. To me, the film flies by and, you know, he, he manages to make it cinematic and not just have like a filmed play. You know, I, I watched heard recently heard a director who adapted a play, uh, a play into a film. And he's like, you know, instead of just because it was one location, you know, you can't just have two of them talking at a table the whole time. He's like, he just always made sure that they, they had something to do, you know, and that they were moving, not to make it distracting, but that it looked realistic. And here we have that too. Like it, it's very real that, you know, the, the dishes break, that they're going, they're going, one takes a bath and the other one takes a bath, looking at a book, going to the couch. Um, you know, again, it's not just to keep the pace up, but it's just to move the action so we're not just in one looking at one static shot or cutting between the two of them sitting at a table. He makes it very visually interesting. You know, I don't know how you felt about that. Yeah, that reminds me of two movies in particular. Leclis, where you talked about Antonioni um, with Monica Vitti and Alan Delon. And they have these long sequences where yeah. they're just interacting with each other. But it's yeah. always interesting and like how the yeah. camera really gets very close up to them. It's like very visually interesting, even though it's long sequences of them talking to each other. Yes, yes and, exactly. And this also reminded me of um, one of Godard's films, which I absolutely love because it's so bonkers, is Weekend. And oh, you have a couple of months long ago. sequences. Like this one is just this very long car crash sequence where it's just like, all these people on the side of the road and everyone's in various states of distress or not distress. And, and it goes on for a while, but it's, it's, and it's long and there's not a ton going on. And it's just following this car with this couple kind of who are plotting to kill each other <laughs> at the same time. How it's going along movie. this very long 
sequence, but Godard makes it super interesting, even though yeah. it's just, it, it goes on a little too long, but it doesn't feel that way. So it just yeah. kind of reminded me of those two, those two movies where, yeah, you're like, I, I always think that that middle sequence in, in Contempt is just really interesting, even yeah. though it goes on for quite a long time. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. And I, and I don't mean to sound like, you know, you can't hold the audience's attention with two with simply two people. I mean, something that comes to mind but is it's like harder my dinner to with do. Andre. It's harder to do. Like something mm-hmm. that comes to mind is like my dinner with Andre, where it's literally mm-hmm. like most of the film is that dinner. And it's fascinating. But yeah, to have one scene for for like that long and make it so vis- also visually interesting as well as the dynamic between the two is really challenging. And I I really think Antonioni was um a big influence here, like you oh, like you yeah. described. Um yeah, I don't think I had any other anything else I wanted to mention. Was there anything else you had, Raquel? Oh yeah, so I um Studio Canal actually sent me the 4K. Oh yes, the 4K of the movie. Um, uh, it looks absolutely stunning, especially since oh, you have that beautiful cinematography. The red, the yellow, and the blue really pop on the 4K. And this is my first 4K disc ever. I've I my husband has a 4K of something I forget, maybe Citizen Kane. Um, but I've never had a 4K before, so this is my first one. And because it's so beautifully shot, it looks absolutely beautiful on 4K. It doesn't have much for extras, and my complaints about it are the fact that the subtitles, because there's like English, French, and German spoken throughout the movie, that the English subtitles only come up for the French parts, which was frustrating for me. But um, otherwise, I thought it looked really good. And um, and this is new. I think it just came out in November this month. So um, okay, great. So, and like I think you had, we were talking about this earlier that the Criterion um, version is maybe not available anymore. But Criterion Channel has it so. streaming still and they have yeah. a bunch of extras they have like the original commentary they have a conversation between fritz lang and godard godard talking to a film critic about contempt all the extras are really good so if you're looking for extras and you have that channel oh the, for this one it was packed with stuff yeah 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 i hope they don't take that down because oh, if you <laughs> <laughs> if yeah because i read i don't know for sure if anyone knows if i'm wrong or if i'm right let me know in the comment below because i believe the contempt cr- criterion is out of print okay. uh from what i read but i i but yeah but at least hopefully criterion won't uh take it down anytime soon um hopefully they can hold on to the streaming rights <laughs> yeah 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 exactly and and i just wanted to give a shout out to the composer because I love the uh, the score. Uh, music by George De La Rue and Piero Piccioni. That, yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, I love and and I love how sometimes, <laughs> again, clashing styles. Um, he has the score come up in just random moments, like even when Fritz yeah. Lang is walking, it's suddenly it's so dramatic. <laughs> this, this this really dramatic score, but I love the score and Scorsese later used it in good uh, casino in oh, 95. Okay. That's cool. same, yeah. And he, this is his, apparently from what I read, it's his favorite Godard film, if not one of his favorites. Um, you know, there are some great. things that come out of nowhere that are interesting. Like the beginning, the opening credits are spoken. Um, which yes, is unusual. I believe that's, that's Godard himself. I believe. Mm-hmm. Just yeah. like saying, oh, this is starring so and so film, <laughs> like cinematography, but you know, it, it, yeah. I thought that was interesting. Or even some of the visual shots, like um, that house in Capri, I think it's Casa Malaparte, and it's got this beautiful, like they called it like a reverse pyramid stairs going up to the rooftop. And yes. then all like at the end, um, you kind of see the shot and Piccoli's walking up those steps, and it kind of comes out like, whoa, yeah. these stairs are amazing. <laughs> and yes. um, I, I think that's interesting how like the visual aspects kind of like come at you and the, the music kind of comes at you, and then all these like unconventional methods sort of like you're like whoa this is interesting where is this coming from yeah exactly which which again which is why i sort of lean into the fact that we have like these steps that are so beautiful and at the top they're making a film that no one is satisfied with which is so ironic 
Uh, and and at you know we see uh, Bardot and and Palance's characters dead at the end on top of it, which which really shows how much contempt she had that she was willing to, you know, sort of uh, cheat on him, uh, and and have him see it uh, because he so you know and and just get back at him and run off with this guy and then it just blows literally blows up. I mean, it is. It is quite the talk end. about that scene because that scene's wild. The fact that yeah. you don't even see the accident. Uh, I had I had heard that um, Godard had like borrowed um, audio of a car crash from like the library to use. Oh to use wow, it. I didn't know that. So you don't actually see the car, but when the car crash is actually happening, like Jack Palance speeds away um, with Bardot in the passenger seat, and it. It the camera starts to pan over um her goodbye yeah, letter. Her letter, yeah. And this is like adieu. Uh, yeah. And then and then you see them having crash in between that like tanker. But um the way that they're dead in the car is completely unrealistic. You yeah, know, it looks like, like statues. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I Which again I is... think that's really interesting because. Godard doesn't go for like the flashy, like grotesqueness of a real accident. It almost is like a work of art in a way. It's not realistic at all. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think again, it's it's that that mess he's making visually as well, like doing mm-hmm. things. I mean, I wouldn't even consider that looking poor, uh, looking like it's badly done, but but kind of, because again, you're aware that it doesn't look realistic. So again, yeah. it's it's he he's 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 making it a harder experience and and making you aware of the form yes uh and the clashing of those styles just like everyone is clashing in so many ways that's a good point film. godard is making the the audience work through the whole yeah, movie whole, it's yeah. not like one of those yeah. passive movies you could just sit yeah, and relax no. and watch yeah no no and all his films are like that yes. uh, <laughs> <laughs> so true but yeah i love I love, I absolutely love uh, this film. I know that not everyone loves loves it, or it's not like one that that people, you know, all cinephiles appreciate. But I, I certainly do. So I was glad we uh, took a deep dive into this one, Raquel. Yeah, no, and this was a great opportunity for me to revisit this because I think I appreciated it more on this. Me too. Year. Yeah, certainly. Me too. Um, I know I always ask, you You know, from coming on my show, I always ask guests to uh, plug their social media out, you know, handles and websites. So if people want to follow your work, uh, where's the best place for them to go? Well, right now I'm doing a YouTube series on my channel, which is Out of the Past Blog. Um, and I'm doing a weekly series I publish every Monday where I talk about three classic movies, a classic movie book, and then I throw in like a wild card, just something fun that I found that's classic movie related. And I've been doing weekly episodes, so I would highly encourage people to check me out there. And then I also have a blog, outofthepastblog.com, where I talk about classic movies. And I'm on Blue Sky, I'm on Twitter, um, or X as it's called. Um, so you can find me there too. I'm just under my name, Raquel Stetcher. Great. Fantastic. And I'll leave the links in the description box below where people can uh, follow Raquel and check out her website and YouTube channel. So Raquel, thank you again so much. This has been such a great chat and, and come again uh, sometime soon. Thank you. I'm excited. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. I want to thank all of my members on Patreon. If you're interested in becoming a member of my Patreon, head over to the link patreon.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies for full details. Patreon is exclusive content that I create month in and month out. And as a subscriber, you are able to vote on polls and contribute to what I do on Patreon month in and month out. So head over to the link for full details. You can also leave a donation directly to my YouTube channel by pressing the thanks link, which you will find directly below the video frame. Just click on the thanks link and you can leave a donation there if you choose to. And lastly, if this is your first time here, please consider subscribing. It is absolutely free to do so. By pressing the Robert Bellissimo at the movies logo, you will see it floating above my head in the top left corner. To your top left in just a second, just click on that and then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release one of my new episodes also click the like button and leave a comment below let me know what you think of this episode 
Also, you can also share the episode. All of these things are what produce traction uh, to my YouTube channel. So I appreciate you watching and thank you again. And I will see you in the next episode.